ability, waterproofness, etc. I don't think there's. I don't know what that material is. Um, it probably would look a lot like it did back in the 20s. Um, people would buy in bulk and uh, take their bags to the store and, and uh, eat more fresh food quickly, quicker. I mean, plastic has its benefits. It's why we, we have so much of it. But, um, Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, um, again, I would say re reuse and refill systems. Um, you know, uh, those look different in different places, but here in the U.S. and I think especially here uh, in the peripheral region of Wisconsin, it's you know the milkman model, right? It's like we, it's not, it's not rocket science. You know, some of us lived through those models. Some of some of those models are continuing to to grow, and and there's a bit of a resurgence now. Um, but yeah, we use a refill systems, right? It's like buying in glass and bottle deposit returns and all that sort of good stuff. Um, it, it's in very much a, a sense of going back to systems that already exist and just continuing to incorporate best practices. I'm hand this right back to you. I have a feeling. Is there anyone here informed about an effort, if any, to get a bottle fill law? like Oregon or Michigan or other states, that would include a deposit for single-use plastic. In the state of Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. I, I mean, um, there are groups who are pushing for that kind of uh, policy change, and the uh, bottle deposit return systems are one of them. There's, um, I would say the big uh, policy initiative, if you're interested in it, is uh, Extended Producer Responsibility, EPR, is the term that gets used a lot, and that's just a fancy Washington, D.C. term for putting the responsibility of collecting and recycling the material back on the people who produced it, on these corporations who produced it. Um, so those EPR policies are being advocated for all over the place. A couple of states were listed as examples of good policies. Um, we also advocate, uh, we actually just had a big Hill Week in Washington, D.C., flew folks in from all over the country to lobby on behalf of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which offers comprehensive solutions for the plastic pollution crisis at a federal level. Um, and that legislation uh, includes EPR and other mechanisms for like bottle deposits and um, uh, standardized recycling labels, recycling content, um, minimum recycling content, uh, standards, so meaning like the quality of the plastic that you're producing has to be of a minimum quality in order to uh, continue producing it, so it actually continues to strengthen the recycling system. So there's lots of good policy measures like that. But I would point to the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act as kind of the gold standard for what's happening here in the U.S. Thank you. These are the last two audience questions, and then and then we'll turn it over to the panel to. You can ask each other questions and then audio, like any other questions from the audience. Walmart recycles plastic bags. Why can't, I think this means Southwest sanitation. When Viroqua went from selling yellow trash bags to expensive trash and recyclables, the amount of trash on the curb went up exponentially. What was wrong with the old way? That was a question. So maybe either. The old way of uh, collection? Um, Walmart uh, says they recycle bags, but uh, they don't recycle bags. That's right. They collect bags and they throw them in the garbage. Um, yeah, it's the sad, sad truth. Uh, just like the other grocery stores, those bags aren't truly recyclable. Um, the volume of recyclables in Baroque increased when we when we went to the automated tote system and people had more capacity um, and it was easier for people. More people participate participate now than did under the old program. The old program, uh, um, I explained it a little bit before, but um, it's less efficient, less uh, um, effective, more containers, more uh, manual labor in the street, um, and just a, a lot less participation. So, that the, and it's not a new system, actually. It's, it might be new to Europa and Vernon County, but um, the old source separated collection method started back in 1990 and the majority of the country does it 
does their curbside collection in a commingled manner, in an automated manner in containers. And uh, the volumes have increased significantly in, in Baroque and uh, um, with the commingled and with, with the containers. And I, I don't, which I guess uh, you'd have to assume that the trash volume has decreased at the same time. So does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. Did you want to add anything, Stacey? I, I, we, I work with the townships, again, different animal, but um, the townships that have the bag system where you have to buy the bag from the, the township, I feel like that helps force people to recycle, because otherwise you have to pay and buy more garbage bags, so you're going to be more likely to recycle. However, it could be a double-edged dagger on that if you don't have a good site tent watching over stuff, too because that leads to the wish cycling. People just throw out everything in the plastic bin or everything in the paper bin or what have you because they don't want to pay for another bag. So depending on the situation, it could be a plus and it can be a dagger. Like it just depends. And, and Vernon County, we're lucky. We've got a lot of very good site attendants out at the townships um, that, are, that are just as passionate and <laughs> as passionate as I am about this. So, um, so like I said, it can be a, it can be a good system, but it's got to be enforced too. Thank you. What is the best recycling guideline source for plastic, paper, cardboard, etc.? Your hauler or whoever's providing the service. All right. So that concludes the broken plastic free questions. It concludes the audience questions. Some some of the questions I didn't ask because they were answered in the conversation. Are there any questions that you want to ask each other before we turn it over to the audience for a conversation? Yes. No? Okay. Hi, I have a bit of a policy question that you might not know about, but this morning I read a uh, headline from the Organic Consumers Association that there's a push to uh, take plastics out of the national organic standards. So I don't know if you have any comments on that and what, how that would shake up the industry. And hydroponics as well. Any comments on it? Thank you. Does that mean they'd be getting rid of like agricultural plastic? Because <laughs> that would be lovely. <laughs> Inorganic in production. Ugh, that would be lovely. I so in running the landfill again, I see kind of both sides of this. So ag plastic causes more headaches in the landfill because um, it, it creates shelves. It creates shelves in the landfill, so the leachate, any water that hits the landfill, we have to pump out and treat. Um, and that plastic gets spread out across the landfill and it tends to shelf water. So it leads to a lot of issues with the landfill because that's right now we've got a company that comes around. They're called Revolution Plastics that are supposed to be picking it up. But just like everything else, it's, it's money driven. So they're reducing the amount of stuff they'll take. They're getting very particular and it has to be clean and it's not clean. So that's it usually ends up at out at our facility or another landfill somewhere and it's it's a headache so if they got rid of that that would be great <laughs> yeah and i'm pretty convinced that even if revolution's plastic picks it up and it gets down to the facility that it's often not getting recycled yeah the um so there's quite a bit of research coming out about um about plastic pollution from agricultural production. Specifically, there was a report that was just put out a couple months ago on agrochemicals um, uh, by the Center for International Environmental Law. And that was focused especially on these like slow release fertilizers, which are marketed to farmers uh, as, as being good for their production because it's slow release over the course of you know the day but it's slow release because it's got a plastic coating on it that's breaking down, right? So that's breaking all these microplastic particles into the soil, which of course the benefits of organic certification and everything that that stands for is that you're taking, it's good stewardship of the land and the resources, right? And good food production as a result. Um, so I know folks are talking about this. You know, I know um, it actually, I was, I was fortunate to, um, to uh, join the crop cooperative banquet dinner most recently, the Organic Valley Co-op. Um, my partner's family are Organic Valley farmers, and uh, it came up in the keynote that evening that like this is you know the one sort of call to action 
uh, by Jane Siemens, Siemens. yes, who's a, who's a founder of the Viroqua, the, um, the Youth Initiative High School, among other things, and being this founding matriarch of the Organic Valley Cooperative, her call to action was like, we gotta get the plastic off our farms, right? So um, it was very exciting to hear that. I think folks in the community are talking about it. Uh, researchers we work with are putting out, you know, uh, new papers and, and studies about it. Uh, so, and I'll just say personally, I started my career in, in the good food and agriculture movement, working on, you know, the farm bill and working with some of the folks who do organic, uh, you know, Stonyfield Organic and those folks. Uh, and so I'm particularly interested in, in this subject and I think it would be great, like, uh, and I imagine that most of the folks in the Break Free from Plastic movement would agree with that. This may be a really dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, I shop at the co-op, so, and our vegetables all get put in these what look like plastic bags. Are they plastic or are they biodegradable? Does anybody know? shop there too and I put my stuff in them same bags or I try not to when I can but I think they're plastic bags ah, uh, okay. same with the cutlery it is not it's not um, yeah. and they, they excuse it because they say you know it'll break down but it won't break down in your compost pile is it has to go to one facility in the United States where they do it under certain conditions. Mm. So you just imagine you're eating at the co-op. Are you putting your fork in that box that's going to be sent to that facility? Or are you putting it in the garbage? Are you putting it in recycling? In any of those containers, that's wrong container. Mm -hmm. And you, so then again, people feel good about it. Yeah. And that we have to be... Um, not to be a Debbie Downer, but <laughs> there's a lot of great greenwashing going. Gotcha. And we have to really read the labels and things like that. We have a student who, a group of students in my class, uh, we studied in environmental science class, we studied plastics one year. And a group of students studied compostable plastic. Compostable plastic. <laughs> There's a board about it over here somewhere, but they they recognize that it's only compostable in these high temperature facilities, really big facilities. And the closest one was in Minnesota, and they tried to access it and visit it, and they couldn't. Like the the facilities around the country, are, there's very few of them, and and it's just you know so you need a different kind of material for it to work. Um, we have one back here, and then. All of us remember before we had oil-based plastics, uh, we had celluloid, uh, which is looks like clear plastic. It's more rigid, crinkles. Uh, it's made out of cellulose. Uh, I assume it's probably not recyclable. Uh, I suppose you could chop it up and make insulation out of it. But, uh, does anybody know? Does it does it does it break down organically uh, as a compost or, or whatever? And we have one bin that says commingled, 
So that's everything you guys have been talking about, including glass and metal. Um, but then there's another bin that's just, they say cardboard only, but I'll put paper in there. And I agree that is one of the most easily accepted. Yeah. Stacy, could you add what you're going to say? Oh, yeah, um, like all our stuff that we take in, we separated mixed plastics, and that's, you know, your office paper, newspaper, magazines, um, even the milk cartons, our recycler will take those. Um, just they don't want anything with a wax coating on it. Or plastic coating. So or not, plastic coating, yeah, so they don't want any of that on there. Um, but, yeah, the, our stuff all gets shipped directly to the, to the mill, um, and it's... It's a hot commodity right now. I've had three different brokers contact me in the last month trying to get trying to get additional volume for this stuff. Because if you think about it, the world we're living in, everybody's shopping online and it's all being shipped in a cardboard box to your house. Like that's so it's a it's a very hot commodity. So milk cartons, yes, even though they have the waxy coating. Okay. Yeah, those can go on the mixed paper. Okay. For my purposes anyway, I don't know if those are It depends from one municipality to the next. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like the uh, yeah, I, I just know it's not it's not necessarily standardized. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's one but of those. But cardboard, plain cardboard is always. Yeah. yeah. It's been recycled forever, cardboard. Yeah. Did you want anything about paper? What about glossy paper? Like magazines and stuff. Yep. Yeah, that that's fine. And the reason why we they, they keep cardboard separate from mixed paper is because cardboard's got a higher value, almost always, always has historically. Uh, why then can't we use no, the paper hot. sacks for the land, for stuff that's going to, um, you know, the dump or something? Like that. Instead of putting our trash in plastic bags, why couldn't we put our trash in paper sacks? Would that be an advantage? You can do that. You can do that, but now you're not recycling the paper, it's being landfilled. But it'll break down in the landfill, so there's yeah. there's a plus to that. Yeah. I mean, who owns who owns hefty? You know, <laughs> like that's I mean that's why that's why you can't do it because it's being sold to you otherwise. So good good luck, you know. Getting back to Brett's um, comment about the federal break free from plastic legislation, is that what it's called? Break free from plastic. Um, that's exciting. I'm I'm curious what are the often when we're talking about legislation, there's we're trying to educate people about the cost of something and um, or the health implications. What are the main arguments that you're making to legislators, and do you have any sponsors? Yeah, there's like 140 something co-sponsors in the House and Senate um, for the bill. Uh, it, um, I mean, the main arguments are for you know it's against the plastic pollution, the toxicity, the greenhouse gas contributions. If we're serious about tackling the climate crisis, um, and it's about. Uh, strengthening our recycling system and, and restoring confidence in our recycling system and, and having a recycling system that actually works. So, uh, and at the same time, utilizing that transition um, to build a more sustainable and just future. Um, so we talk a lot about job creation, right? We throw around a statistic, there was a report that a group um, called Gaia, the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, put out a report uh, showing that Reuse and refill systems uh, create 200 times more jobs than creating a traditional landfill or incinerator. Um, so we talk a lot about that and what that can bring to like local congressional districts and things like that. But you just try to meet people where they are and try like everyone wants the recycling system to work. We've done polling that shows that everyone wants to improve recycling, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum or where you are geographically in the country. Um, people want recycling to work. So. Uh, we really lead with that as like, even this panel I think is an example of how that happens at a local level. Recycling is kind of the on-ramp for people to have a broader dialogue about what our waste stream looks like and what a truly sustainable system could look like for the future. Uh, the big term that gets thrown around a lot now is like a circular economy. So how can we have a truly circular economy um, that's continuing to reuse those same products over and over again? I would 
like to be able to find really specific information on um, the websites, the county website and the Southwest Sanitation website about, so what exactly is acceptable in paper? Is it a cardboard box that I get from a restaurant that seems to have some kind of waterproof lining on the inside? Um, can I put that in with household paper? Um, there, when a milk carton or a juice carton, they, they don't open like a carton anymore. They all have a plastic screw-on cap. And I know you should throw the cap away, but so they take it anyways with the built-in plastic with the carton. But it, it's a, a, a topic of discussion in some people's households, what should or should not go into the recycling. And <laughs> I don't know, should I just call both of your offices when I have a specific question? And would you sometimes update your website if you had a pattern of... Yeah, it should be on our website. Well, I, I looked at it. Um, well, that's my question. So I'm, I'm working on our county website. I've done work on it multiple times. Um, our program is pretty much... We deal with a lot of the, like I said, we deal with all the townships except Liberty, and then we work with the city of Westby and the village of Lafarge. On all of my dumpsters, I actually just redid all of our signage for dumpsters. I'm getting them printed hopefully soon, but that literally have an acceptable and a not acceptable, and there's pictures. Good. Um, it's just yeah. getting people to look at them. <laughs> that's the that's the thing. So um, that's that's coming for my side of things. And then once I get that signage out on our on our dumpsters, I'll put it on our website. And, um, I'm trying to get a little more done with the city of Westby and the village of Lafarge too, because we don't have any just a dumpster there. They they curbside pick up that stuff in those two communities um, and then bring it to our facility. So it's coming. Sorry, I'm a little slow. I'm pretty pretty minimal staffed out there, but we, we get what we can. keep a website updated, it's not easy like Facebook, and I wouldn't want it to be on Facebook, I wouldn't want it to be on the website, and I understand it's a struggle to keep it updated. Yeah, and it's, my biggest thing is how to word stuff, you know, you know what I'm saying, like to, how I type something and how I read it is different because I'm, I work with this stuff, and how to board it properly so it doesn't add to the confusion that's already there. Um, that's kind of my <laughs> my big thing, but it takes me a while. Thank you. Did you want to add anything No, check our website. It's, it's there. And we got pictures there. Okay. Last question of the evening. Oh, okay. Well, I better make it good. <laughs> now, outside of the one, two, and five plastics and whatever, um, and outside of the financial considerations and the technology that it's available or not, is there any research being done on the other plastics that can make them viably recycled or repurposed? It's been tried. Yeah, it's been tried and failed over the years um, for a lot of reasons. One, it's not economically viable, and, um, and, and uh, logistically, and it's been tried many times, tried and failed over the years. And um, we used to collect all one through sevens. There was a ton, about five times over the last decades that uh, the industry or the the, uh, the plastics industry or the sorting facilities, they wanted all of it and let um, the three through sevens or three through, with, with the exception of fives, they, they've all failed. They've failed for economic purposes and, and uh, other purposes. Uh, yeah, I can. Well, I don't need this. I'll just get this to you. But um, so I actually, in preparation for this, um, I don't consider myself a panelist. So I thought I'd better get on the horn to some people. So I called the. Um, her name's Elizabeth Lamers, and she works with Quincy Recycling out of the, that's the facility we send all our plastics to. And I was like, what happens to it? I just want to know which what what you're doing with it. Um, so. Number six is she said tend to go back into medical grade equipment. Um, number three is she said they a lot of their stuff gets made into um, rail ties and plastic palleting. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And she, she, she I asked because I was asking, okay, what is your what is your waste at the end of this thing? Like I know it goes through the system. What? How much are you wait? How much is going into the landfill on the back end? And 
she wouldn't give me a number, which I know we're all surprised, but she said that they're in the business to make money too, right? So they're they're called a material recovery recovery facility, a MRF. So they try to sell as much of that back into the recycling market into to get it reused because what they don't they're losing money. They gotta pay to dispose of it in a landfill. So she was very and she's she's about as passionate as I am about this stuff and she was getting fired up when I was asking her questions. So I was like, oh, sorry, but um and her biggest one was number four is like them plastic bags are just the worst. Um, I have three um, ones I give out at the fair every year because I get to luckily go around the landfill and pick up the ones that blow out and it's super fun after a whole, you know, windstorm of 40 miles an hour and stuff. So please make sure you get your, get your reusable bags. Like that is the one recycling number that she gave me that was awful and she wished they would quit making it. And that's coming from a Murph. <laughs> Yeah, I would just say, um, again, like reusable bags are, are definitely the way to go. Um, but as far as like those other plastics, you were asking about the other numbers. Um, I mean, I would be hard pressed to find someone who says there's a market for it, even listing those examples. Like, again, when we're talking about the entire, all the plastic that's ever been produced, they estimate roughly 9%, maybe 10% has ever been recycled. When we're talking about the annual recycling rate in the U.S., we're looking at five to six percent, um, and that's mostly the ones and twos and fives. So those other, I mean, if you know, if someone tells you that they're taking sixes and they're turning it into something, the percentage we're talking about is so small. It's essentially a marketing campaign. Um, so I would say the the way of the future is the reuse and refill systems. It's streamlining the recycling system for plastic so that ones, twos, and fives, which actually do have a market, can be functional um, and can be effectively recycled, getting rid of all those other cheap plastics, right? Getting rid of the stuff that's the most toxic. Um, really investing in glass and steel and aluminum and cardboard and bamboo and other things that can be effectively recycled much with much more value than plastic uh, and without the toxicity. Um, and then there's exciting legislation that's passed recently in California and elsewhere, California being the biggest market uh, around these bio-based and compostable plastics. Um, folks have been throwing around some terms tonight. I'll just say there's a difference between like bio-based, uh, bio-compostable. As we've talked about, there's a difference between composting in your backyard and being like effectively composted in one of these facilities. How did, you know, is it going to get to that facility? So I would just say, um, as, as there's a lot of research that's going to be coming out, so if you're interested in the compostable element of like bio-based uh, plastics and things like that, um, keep an eye out for that research because it's, uh, it's not clear yet which products are actually compostable and what's better and what's not. Um, and that's why I always advocate for the reusable and refillable systems, right? It's your, your steel water bottle and your reusable canvas bag and things like that. I have a question. Does anybody here know what the number is like for post-consumer generated plastics versus like industrial generated plastic waste? Like is there a number to that as, as to like how much is like us and how much is the big industry that's generating this stuff? I mean there's definitely figures out there. I would say um, there's, uh, so I don't know, yeah, I don't know the figures, but I can say that there's definitely um, information about how much consumer generated like single use plastic is coming from packaging, and then how much um, is being, you know, wasted by facilities, but I would say like nurdle spills, the little plastic pellets and things like that. But I, again, I would argue like the consumer plastic, you know, when I buy a bottle of Coca-Cola, I don't want the plastic, that's the cheapest, mm -hmm vessel that they'll sell it to me in, and then I have to deal with that problem, right, of recycling that plastic. You all have to deal with the mm -hmm. plastic bottle that winds up in your in your stream. So um, I would put that on as I would say that's also from the industry, you know? But I but I hear you in terms of like what's coming from like, you know, big petrochemical plants versus like what from like, we're collecting, you know, what we're collecting, like how much of the problem is that? You know what I mean? Like Definitely. What kind of number? Yeah, I mean, we saw we saw potatoes. single use plastic waste spike during. I mean, it it was a it actually was interesting during the pandemic because it uh, 
single-use plastic from like consumers spiked, but then industrial use of plastic went down, so the amount of plastic, because like people stopped making cars and things like that. Um, but that's why we focus on the cheap, like single-use plastic waste, the packaging, that really doesn't have a value for any of us, it's just being pushed on us by the industry. And then it's messing up your recycling <laughs> system. So, you know, our recycling system that we all pay for, right? So. Mm. We're near the end, we have permission to ask a couple more questions. Um, I saw Kayla and Jim and Kathy. Well, you talked about how, what change can happen at the federal level, and what change can happen at like in our own homes and at the state level, but what can we do as a community here in Barroqua or here in the county to actually make some some legislate or some policy changes or, or some actual change. I, I I think it'd be something, and I <laughs> might be stepping out here. Um, I, I work for the county. Maybe start at the county level. Start talking to your county board supervisors, like, hey, we're, or your city, your mayor, about banning like plastic things like plastic bags, pushing people, advertising more to you know, use glass or and tin over the plastic stuff. It's, you know, you guys, as the purchasers, like, let's maybe start saying, hey, we don't want to buy your plastic Coke bottle. We want it, we want it to us in glass. So until that happens, you know, maybe start, start with local community stuff with like the plastic bags or just, if you would do that for me, I'd so appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like plastic, plastic bags, I think that would be, that would be a great local movement. And Veroke was, so forward with this stuff, like I think it'd be a great place to to see something like that. I just, there's so much passion here for this stuff. I think that'd be great. So unfortunately, the only thing is that there was a law passed in Madison um, under uh, the Scott Walker administration um, that basically puts a preemptive ban on any. Uh, thank you on any uh, any sort of plastic bag ban or anything like that. So that. Uh, and there's other states that have passed it since then, but Wisconsin was sort of like, I don't want to say ahead of the curve, but an early mover on like banning municipalities from any sort of bans <laughs> regarding packaging. Um, and that, I mean, if that's not like the industry, if that's, if that's not the industry like pushing for, you know, their agenda, um, yeah, I mean, so what you can do is advocate for change in Madison to get those sorts of things passed. But in the meantime, um, like what I've been really excited working with for Oprah Plastic Free on is like what can be done locally. The bags are an amazing example of like just getting more bags out. So you can incentivize people, right, to do good as opposed to penalizing businesses or putting some sort of ban. And that's what is forbidden by law here in Wisconsin, right? Um, of course, that's part of why we advocate at the national level as well, because then that would supersede the state level. Um, but if you want to make that type of change, it has to happen in Madison. The other thing you can do locally is work with businesses on more sustainable solutions, right? So like, um, I've had some good conversations with folks here uh, on the Chamber of Commerce who would be, you know, who have expressed interest in like bringing more businesses together. And one way that could look is, you know, investing in industrial washer. So, um, you know, if you get a handful of businesses together who are interested in being more sustainable and they figure out, you know, how to share an industrial washer the same way that there is like, uh, you know, a kitchen space that gets shared on, on the edge of town when folks want to start a new business, right? That creates benefit for the whole community where you have, you know, X number of businesses that can now wash reusable plates and coffee cups and silverware and all that sort of stuff and sanitize it so that it meets health department standards and that creates opportunities to do reusables at events like this, or the Driftless Music Festival, or other public events in town. So it's like, I think it's about collective action. There's, so, there, there's such a cooperative culture here um, that there's already like a really solid foundation for that type of organizing. Our microphone has stopped working. Yeah. We, we are really running out of time. We have to be out of here by 8 o'clock, and that means <laughs> we have to clean up. I promise we'd be done by 7.30, but we're allowed to a little bit more. Jim, I think you might be the last question, unless Kathy has something well, fast. Well, speaking as a person that's very interested in plastic pollution, but also as a farmer who uses sale wrap, you know, I, I and I've talked to Bill about this, and I, I realize it's a tremendous problem. 
but you got to realize how things were all tied together because climate change has made it more and more difficult to produce dry hay that you can put in a shed. Bale wrap is a lifesaver as far as hay goes. And uh, yeah, I think it is recyclable. The problem is it always comes in so dark and dirty. And I think the real solution to that, what, how do you get a farmer to do something? You pay him. You know, <laughs> really, I think there needs to be a charge uh, when you buy the bail, the, the bail wrap and a reward that goes back to the farmer for returning it clean. It can be returned clean. It doesn't need to be just thrown in all the rest of the stuff. When it comes off a bale, it's really very clean. But I think you need to realize this is a boon for farmers, and there really isn't any other alternative right now. Uh, making dry hay has gotten more and more difficult over the years with the weather changes. I'll, I'll just say super quickly, and then um, actually there's another plastic event going on this evening that I promised I would like hop. They're doing a screening um, for this local Sierra Club chapter, so I got to run to that and hop on a panel. But um, the one thing I'll say is like, this is why it, with the Break Free from Plastic movement, everything we focus on is about eliminating the cheap single-use plastic packaging, not the hay wraps, not the plastic that's in your car or your television, because ultimately I think that's like personally, not speaking on behalf of anyone else, I think that's where we need to go. We have to find substitutes for these materials because they're toxic. Like we're finding out more and more, they're disrupting our endocrine systems. They're causing all sorts of problems with reproductive issues, with fertility rates. Like, I mean, it's really, it's bad. And so um, ultimately we have to get away from the plastic, uh, but we're, we're, the, pr the problem is so pervasive right now that I don't think anybody's talking about what, um, about like eliminating that material from, for wrapping hay bales on farms, but it's about finding um, an alternative material that could be used to, to like